Welcome back to Inside City Hall. Earlier this month, the state's Department of Environmental Conservation released its full report on the likely effects of drilling for natural gas upstate and plans to regulate the process known as hydrofracking. Now, advocates of the drilling say that it will bring thousands of jobs to the state, while opponents are arguing that the process could pollute the state's drinking water supply and cause a lot of other problems. Here to discuss the issue is an opponent of hydrofracking. Claire Sandberg is the co-founder and executive director of Frack Action. And joining us from Buffalo is a supporter of the drilling process. Dennis Holbrook is an executive at Norse Energy, and he's a member of the Independent Oil and Gas Association. Welcome to both of you. And um, Dennis, I want to start with you. Um, the industry appears to have gotten at least a yellow light from the Cuomo administration. Is that, is that a fair interpretation of uh, what you folks are now prepared to do? I'm not sure, Errol, whether, whether I'm ready to color code just yet where we are. Uh, we've clearly had a red light now for three plus years as far as the opportunity to move forward. Uh, we do have some encouraging signs from the uh, Cuomo administration that they're ready to allow the science to move the process forward rather than a lot of uh, emotion that's been guiding it up till now. So I guess in that sense, if you want to color code it, uh, it's clearly something better than where we've been up till now. And, and, and speaking of emotion, let's show the map, folks, of um, where the, the area that this would take place is really located. Hydrofracking is how you get natural gas out of the ground, or it's a, a way of doing it. And the light tan that you see there, folks, is a, a section of the world called the Marcellus Shale Formation. It extends across uh, a, a number of different states, but the southern New York, the southern tier of New York, is where uh, we touch on it. And as you can see, it overlaps with the blue that you see there is aquifers, that's drinking water. The uh, brighter yellow is surface drinking water. Those are the reservoirs that supply New York City with its water. And uh, state parks are the green that's there. There are those, including Claire Sandberg, who think that this is not a place where we should be going to uh, drill for natural gas. Why is that? Right. You know, as we're coming up upon this period where the DEC has issued revised regulations and has spent a couple of years now looking at this, taking a careful look at this, it's no surprise that gas companies are saying that we've looked at this long enough and let's just march forward. But what we're seeing right now, almost every day, is more damning scientific evidence that we should question whether and not how, not when, to do this. Uh, we just saw the U.S. Geological Survey revise their estimates on the amount of gas that's actually in the Marcellus Shale. They found that gas companies overstated the amount of the Marcellus Shale by 80 percent. That means that the gas is just not there, and neither are the jobs, neither are the royalties for landowners, neither are the revenues for the state, not at the level that the gas industry has claimed and that the DEC has actually repeated recently. Mm -hmm. this, new, this new announcement came out just a few days before the DEC released their own socioeconomic impact study. So at this point, we're seeing clear, obvious problems that have been scientifically documented about the safety of this practice, and we're also seeing that there may be no rationale for doing this at all. Let me let uh, De Dennis respond to that. I've heard the Marcellus Shale described as, you know, sort of the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, that there's uh, you know, centuries worth of natural gas up there. Has that been overstated? I, I don't think so at all. I th I'm, I'm sort of surprised by Claire's statement because I'm not sure what report she's alluding to. The U.S. Geological Survey that she alludes to said the exact opposite of, of her characterization. They didn't say that the industry has been over-reporting. They said that their own estimate has now been increased by 4,000 percent. That's 4,000 percent increase in the estimate of what will be achievable in the Marcellus Shale. Think about that on an order of magnitude. The Energy Information Agency, another governmental agency, has placed even a higher figure on what they believe to be the potential of the Marcellus Shale and the other related black shales. Mm -hmm. So I find it sort of fascinating that, that Claire and, and some of her antis are concerned about whether it's economic for the industry to move forward and pursue the shale development. I think as, as people uh, uh, from the Wall Street Journal on down have pointed out that that the likes of Shell and Exxon and some of the other majors would not be moving into this area and expending billions of dollars if the potential were not there. I'm not sure who she thinks they're trying to fool. So I think the fact that the DEC, among a whole number of studies, including uh, the Manhattan Institute, Penn State University, MIT, I can go th through a litany of lists 
okay, of academic enough. studies let me, let me that have been endorsed. Let me allow her to respond. I mean, Claire, either there's a lot of natural gas or there's a whole lot of natural gas. Either way, Norse Energy and a bunch of other companies have decided it's worth their while to try and, and, and get it out. Well, there are a few fallacies here. First of all, the USGS slashed the estimates of the amount of gas in the Marcellus Shale based on the industry projections. Terry Engelder of Penn State University, the so-called godfather of the Marcellus Shale, said that there are 500 trillion cubic feet of gas in the Marcellus Shale. That number has been used to extrapolate the number of jobs, the, number of, uh, the amount of royalties, the amount of revenues for New York State. That is the basis for all of the big promises that people across this state are getting. And the USGS debunked that. They also de debunked the Energy Information Administration's numbers, which were from the gas companies themselves. So this is just an issue of semantics, and it's not just the environmental groups that are saying that the USGS slashed the numbers. It was Bloomberg News, you know? So. Yeah, but uh, but uh, uh, help, help me understand this. If there's less gas than maybe was projected, um, then gas companies make less money. That's about the only outcome I, I think that there would be, right? Well, this really gets to the heart of the issue. And we saw the New York Times earlier this summer come out with a startling article, industry whistleblowers saying shale gas is inherently unprofitable, it's a Ponzi scheme, it's akin to Enron and the subprime mortgage meltdown. The bottom line here is that these companies make money whether or not the gas is there. They make money on speculation, passing on the risk to third-party investors, overhyping based on initial production, and they make money on drilling services. They make money to drill a hole in the ground, whether or not there's gas. So there's a reason why industry whistleblowers are saying, hey, we got to look carefully about this. This industry is subprime. They, they, uh, she says you're passing off the risk, Dennis. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I, I find it fascinating. She obviously has a lack of understanding of, of basic economics and how uh, oil and gas exploration companies make money. They do not make money by, by digging a hole in the ground and ha finding no product. So I don't know where she's getting her information. Uh, I would suggest to her that I'm sure she looks at the, at the uh, New York Times as the, as the holy grail, but uh, th they can make some mistakes too, as we've seen in the past. They chose, and that was their business decision and their editorial's decision, to rely on anonymous sources and one quote unquote individual that I'm familiar with who's disgruntled and has been claiming all along that, that the Marcellus Shale revolution isn't what it's cracked up to be. You're always going to have somebody out there that if you really want to seize upon, that you can, you can trump it. But the part that she's missing is, as I said before, she's trying to suggest to us that as businesses who are using our own money to go out and expend uh, to explore, that, that somehow we're, we're trying to fool ourselves. It, 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 there's just a lack of basic logic here. The bottom line is, those government agencies that we're alluding to are suggesting that we're going to have what amounts to natural gas availability well into the next century. That's the part we should be focusing on here and all the tens of thousands of jobs that we've already seen created in Pennsylvania and have the potential to be created in New York. Let's, I mean, let, we can let, speculate let, all day, but we don't really need to speculate. We can look to the job creation that's already taking place elsewhere. Okay, that's fair enough. In fact, let's move on to some of the environmental issues that really were at the, at the heart of so much of this dispute. Um, the, the, the process of hydrofracking involves uh, shooting water down, um, sort of um, shaking up the ground underground. Some chemicals are also combined with it. And then the gas is extracted, and then the question becomes, well, what happens to those, in some cases, billions of gallons of water and the chemicals associated with them when it comes back up? And uh, so, so, Dennis, um, I, I gave a, a very abbreviated and uh, only marginally exact uh, d description of the process, but on that question of what happens to the water when it comes back up, where, where does it go? Well, first of all, you, you, uh, I'll help you out a little bit here. Uh, you can be using uh, relatively small amounts of water. You can be using relatively large. We're not talking typically about billions of gallons. You might be talking about a couple million gallons, uh, up to four or five million gallons in some cases. Uh, I, I know for some people that sounds like a lot of water, but I think it's important to keep in mind that all the drilling going on in Pennsylvania, which is far more expansive than New York would ever be, amounts to a fraction of what is put on golf courses. So in terms of an order of priority, uh, I would think that we would put a higher priority on that which gives us uh, the ability to have light when it's dark, that we have heat when it's cold, and just a whole variety of other things, including the ability to cook our food. So uh, as far as priorities go, and as far as the use of water, I hope that's a fairly 
uh, not well, issue. No, I mean, my, my, we speci- into- my, my specific question, though, was, you know, in the course of a year, according now, to the report, it's about 9 billion uh, gallons. And the question is whether the upstate water treatment uh, c- centers are equipped to handle that much water and make it clean again. Okay. Uh, let's just get back. For each well we're talking about, as I say, you may be talking about three or four million gallons. Uh, to answer your question, and first of all, you have to understand that New York isn't going to have thousands of wells being approved because, as, as we all understand, the DEC is only going to approve them at a pace that they're sufficiently staffed to both permit and also to inspect each well location, and they're simply not staffed for those type of numbers. But back to your question about what happens with the water. One of the things we've discovered from watching uh, the developments elsewhere is that uh, a significant portion of the water that's utilized in the drilling process is actually absorbed into the rock because the rock is is basically dehydrated. So a a significant portion of the the water actually stays in the rock. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't come back up to the surface. What we're dealing with then of the 20% or so that actually comes back up the vast majority of that now is being recycled. So you're not getting what you were trying to allude to, which is billions of gallons a year, because you're not, you're not taking a, a three to five million at every single well. Mm-hmm. You're, you're recycling uh, that which is coming back up. So we end up with a very small portion. The other part that, to answer your question is, in right now, in, presently in New York, we do not have the facilities to process. Part of the reason for that is that New York DEC has to approve facilities that propose to process, and they have to be satisfied that they've installed the necessary treatment equipment. Those facilities, many of them municipal facilities, are awaiting approval from the DEC of the hydrofracking drilling process. They have indicated to us that they are more than willing to to undertake that because many of them have significantly underutilized facilities Mm -hmm. at taxpayer expense right now, and this is an opportunity for them to significantly improve the economics and reduce the tax burden. Those facilities will be monitored by the DEC, approved for their ability to process, and facilities in New York will only be allowed to handle these fluids when those facilities are approved. Okay, very good. Otherwise, those facilities, go ahead. Okay, no, fair enough. Let me uh, uh, bring Claire back into the conversation. Uh, DEC is going to regulate all of this, is, is, uh, is is what Dennis is saying. Right. Well, you know, just last week, 59 scientists, recognized experts in their field, sent a public letter to Governor Cuomo saying these municipal wastewater treatment facilities are not capable of removing the levels of toxic chemicals or even even at minuscule levels of these toxic chemicals and the radioactive material that is present in this fracking wastewater that right now is slated to go to these municipal wastewater treatment facilities where it will be diluted and released into the same rivers and streams that supply our drinking water supply. So that's coming right into our taps. It's actually already coming from Pennsylvania. This is toxic radioactive waste, thousands of times the level of radioactivity as is acceptable in drinking water. And the industry has no plan for how to deal with this waste. It's one of the biggest issues. They say that they are recycling it, but ultimately you have a more toxic waste product at the end of the recycling process. So I don't think that the industry or the DEC has proposed anything to mitigate that major impact. Um, I also just want to respond Errol. briefly to, because the um, other guest mentioned the jobs claims. The independent analysis of jobs claims in Pennsylvania have found that the jobs claims have been vastly overstated with the few jobs that actually have been created are, are dangerous, short term. Most of them are going to transient out of state workers. This influx of out of state workers is bringing huge social impacts like crime, drug use, sexual assault to these communities. So the benefits, economic and energy, are overstated. You know what? Um, That's going to have to be the last word. Claire Sandberg and and Dennis Holbrook, thank you for uh, raising some of these issues with us. And um, I Errol, I would suggest. Yes. I would suggest that that Claire needs the opportunity to get the facts, and she's clearly gotten most of her information from what she's read somewhere else. I would invite her out to see a drilling location. I would invite her out to actually go to these treatment facilities and get an understanding because she's simply misinformed. There is no facility in New York that's been authorized to process anything from Pennsylvania. And I, I find it fascinating when she uses the word radioactive. You know, you can get... A banana has a certain element of radioactivity to it. But there's a big difference between saying something is radioactive and saying it's harmful. And she seems to have misconstrued the two. You, so I think you, we may wanna, need to have another discussion. You want to take him up on that offer? 
Uh, well, I've actually been to a drill site, and I would invite you to the site of the Bradford County spill, where people are living with radioactive tap water being told that their house could explode at any possible moment. So, to, or to meet the families that have barium poisoning with their kids. Well, maybe, I mean, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll have to uh, go on two trips, and it's, if you want to invite us along, we'll send a camera, and we'd be, be glad to join you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much. I am extending the offer, Errol, and I would, would wish that you would take it up. I think, I think we'll do that. Misinformed. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank it you. is time for a break. I'll be back in a minute with some viewer mail and a preview of tomorrow night's program. Stay with us. Yeah.